and the third one is a morphology of course all of you are eminent speakers and galaxy of all the you know persons from different parts of the india each and every parts can be dealt separately taking one hour or more hour but i am just giving a brief account you know third is the morphology morphology means morphology means formation of words you see is starting with phonetics phonology and here something uh, meaningful that is the formation of word word like apple word like beautiful you see beautiful is made of two segments beauty and full so similarly the its micro part is called morphine and the fourth one is syntax which is called formation of a sentence now this is a complete you know the linguistic come in its original form with the formation of sentences when we form sentences we keep in mind that there must be subject to verb and object for example ram eats mango ram is the subject verb eats and mango is the object so this is a scientific alignment as per the called you know uh first subject then verb and finally the object the meaningful component of the linguistic is semantics and pragmatics i don't know much about the semantics and pragmatics but what could i understand the semantics is surface meaning it is non contextual and it is non situational not having any deep indications or meaning so the word is used surface meaning whereas pragmatics has a contextual meaning it has a situational meaning it has a heading meaning and one of the best example which i say the child is a father of a man it has a depth it doesn't mean a child becomes father of a man but it signifies other way it is a contextual it is a situational and it has certain definite meanings linguistic in addition to its micro components it has also macro components which is called external branches maybe psycho linguistics socio linguistic anthropological linguistics philosophical linguistic stylistic linguistics computational linguistic and applied linguistics as a psycho linguistic is concerned it is related to brain you know whenever we talk it is the face is a index of mind means mind and face together gives the psychological effect socio linguistic it is a big chapter i think i have seen many books like on the socio means with the social language linguistic is related with the society we are using such language which is very popular in the society and anthropological linguistic means it is a cross culture it has a broader meaning it is showing behavioral condition philosophical means it is a logical related with the philosophy and then together called philosophical linguistic is stylistic linguistic here it is starts you know the entire beauty of the english language is stylistic linguistic gives a avaaz aa rahi beautiful language 
so stylistic linguistic means beautiful language and depends how to make a beautiful language that is part of you know the stylish language and now recently because of the digitalizations you know one language has been introduced that is called computational linguistics means computer language and last but very important from where there is a entry into the language is applied linguistics this is showing mode of teaching how the linguistics can be applied in the teaching process methodology of teaching and this is what called the applied linguistics so definitely when we are talking linguistics uh, we can recall a baby for example baby or i say we have a sound box in fact sound box means rather we have a lung we have a throat we have a mouth palate tongue and teeth the air which comes out that is with the help of you know the tongue it is twisted and you know the pronunci pronunciation of a particular word gets its shape so i say it is a sound box rather mouth is mainly sometimes the leaves tongue touch to the upper part sometimes it touch to the lower part or sometimes teeth together teeth and tongue this is all you know making some kind of a sound so when baby is saying a uh, o oh, that is called looing other when slightly you know when the living with the families after 6 months or so he starts babbling babbling means joining the word already given example ma da pa so individual now joining is there and later on after one year or so he start talking about the small sentences small words rather doggy car pet and so on so forth and when we he becomes elder and elder then it becomes a big sentence no doubt once it comes to sentence we have a lot of parameters to be considered the arrangement scientific arrangement the grammatical the tense punctuations all these has to be acquisition and learning i wasn't knowing that listening and hearing i used to suppose it is same word but gradually vinod jha has given me an opportunity to go through some of the subjects so i found there's a difference between hearing and listening hearing is somehow sound is coming to your ear and listening means it is very intense attention is there you try to understand what the teacher is saying that is what the listening so here i would like to compare acquisition and learning acquisition is a acquired one it is a mother tongue but when we are talking learning learning is you know after listening you learn some of the things acquisition is natural communications whereas learning is speaking reading writing all these are the parts of this learning process acquisition unaware of the grammar whatever sentence this is simply one understands here she is saying such and such you know the through unaware of the grammar but in case of learning you know awareness of the grammar is required yes. 
it is learning is a set up in the form of former format and the format comes during the schooling age college age or online studies and so on so forth so grammar you know all the the eminent persons already said i say that grammar is very very important part grammar we have to consider the tense whether it is a present past or future tense when it is present when we talk of it is in definite continuous perfect or perfect continuous grammar we have to take in into consideration noun pronoun verb adjective adverbs preposition and you see punctuation so <clears throat> i as a student i started reading english from the fifth of the class and was not knowing what is a punctuation how you to use comma how to use semicolon how to use colon even we talk of dash dash has three format it may be small when it is a large it is called n dash en dash when it is a more bigger it is called m dash e m dash vocabulary is one of the very important part of the entire issue linguistic or even the language now coming on to the point of you see language <coughs> language is a means of communications it is a global language window of the modern world gateway of entry it is a language of business language of modern world unifying language across the india you see it is very difficult when going to south the person cannot understand the hindi and therefore we have to have you see when one is knowing language i think it would be of some help to unifying the different groups you get respect in the society when you are having a english as a language and finally it is the tool for teaching and research so these are the advantages of english language if a man is knowing english he is respectable in the society so that is kept in mind going to the background i know that after independence english was accepted along with the hindi for 15 years but later on you know there was a much hue and cry all over the india and finally it has been accepted as the language of india for ever and that is the 26th january 1965 you know amendment has been made and finally we have come to accept english as the second language all the language comes under article 345 schedule 8 and total we know there are 30 22 languages presently so there are certain guidelines you know particularly in supreme court all the decision needs to be given in english but as the center is concerned both hindi and english as the gadget is concerned it is english hindi or regional language state government so this is a sort of where to accept the hindi english but you see a combination depending upon the territory or the state which is available language as i said the first is a mother language second is local local language english is not the second local santhali for example ora for example bhojpuri and all these are all the second language and there is a foreign language like french and germany and multilingual means a person is knowing a lot of many many languages now as the teaching method is concerned so when we start teaching it is teachers are the pathfinders it is already known it becomes model it becomes model to a students 
makes the subject very easy makes the subject very easy good teacher you see there are certain parts you see there may be good teacher there may be good researcher but rarely we find a good teacher combination of both good researcher and a good teacher lecture in fact is khatam ho gaya so you know when we are giving lecture lot of things are to be done you see there is a body language facial expression hand movement and walking style all these are the components of giving a good teaching we know that a continuous practice is very very essential we have seen the cricketers when interview they have given first time they were very much you know having bubbling type of things not well spoken but in concept khatam ho gaya khatam and subsequently we find the cricketers becomes very much fluent in english and all that so <clears throat> finally coming to the teaching methodology english hindi or whatever it may be we started with the chalk duster and board methods and later you know transformed ourselves you know audio visual and now we have a complete digitalized we are having the webinar rather we can say covid to be one of the very very important you know wound in disguise which is said of course it is a very grave situation but we it has given a opportunity for you know development growth and development of individual and of the society and of the nations as a whole so therefore teacher in addition to what the effort a teacher is doing a student must have to be certain points there must be certain participation in allocution debate seminar they should see tv news they must go through youtube and paper writing paper reading and some english news you know seeing so these are the some of the parts you know which is very effective when we are talking of the linguistics and you know literature so both are rather inseparable both are meaning and with these words just i am finishing my lecture and i am again thankful to the persons who have come from as a chief speaker these are the esteemed persons and this is a pride for this our csk meu university that such a enlightened person have come to the our you know connected with us in a webinar and hopefully when the situation would be normal we would like to have face to face meeting through seminar conference and other methods thank you thank you very much thank you professor hanuman prashad sharma for your uh, very diverse insightful uh, speech and despite being from sciences you have shown a lot of acquaintance with uh, language matters now uh, uh, we would like to move on to our uh, next expert speaker and i am very happy to introduce professor rajnish arora who is the next speaker professor rajnish arora is uh, director uh, regional center efl university lucknow campus and uh, he has received his education in punjab haryana uh, erstwhile andhra pradesh now uh, telangana and united kingdom he has an ma in applied linguistics and phd in english and he uh, specializes in phonetics uh, spoken english uh, discourse and translation he has been recipient of several awards including uh, visiting fellows position at uh, university of warwick united kingdom uh, british council hornby fellowship and krishna swami endowment prize uh, he also stood first in matriculation 
and he has published consistently and guided numerous uh, uh, thesis and dissertations with this very short introduction i request professor rajnish arora to take over from now um, over you. to you professor arora thank you thank you dr tarik for uh, the good words um uh, am i audible yes yes, yes, yes. it's quite yes. yes. Uh, Honourable uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Sona Jaria Mins, uh, Honourable uh, Director C L Professor Rao, uh, Honourable Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Hanuman Prasad Sharma, uh, the eminent speakers Professor Mohanty, Professor Mishra, Professor Hasnain, uh, all three have been my seniors and mentors, uh, Dr. Zarik Khan, uh, Dr. Prashant Kumar, Dr. Uh, uh, Singh, Dr. Jha. Um, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Dr. P. P. Singh, I'm glad to be here in this webinar to uh, talk about linguistic empowerment. I'm glad that uh, Vice Chancellor Madam thought about this, and uh, I think uh, uh, this is a good idea to uh, deliberate on the issues uh, that are involved in uh, language teaching uh, at uh, uh, BA at, at graduate and postgraduate level in uh, your university. Uh, I would like to begin with the, uh, uh, the story of an old lady and a parrot. Uh, an old lady had a parrot who could speak, but the only thing the parrot could say was, who's it? So whoever came home, this parrot would say, who's it? One day this lady was away, must have gone shopping somewhere. A plumber came home, a plumber who mends the taps and all. So he gave a knock at the door. Who's it? The parrot said. It's the plumber lady. The plumber thought it was the lady inside. Who's it? The parrot again said. It's the plumber lady. Who's it? It's the plumber lady. Who's it? It's the plumber lady. The, the plumber had a heart condition. He was so confused that he had a heart attack and he dropped dead on the floor. The lady comes back, looks at the plumber lying dead on the floor and screams, oh my God, who's it? This time the parrot says, it's the plumber lady. The parrot learned its language. You would say structural approach uh, from structural to communicative, from, uh, from, from grammar translation to structural, to communicative, to task-based, task we've come a, long way. I think uh, I can uh, uh, give you a couple of uh, more anecdotes uh, that is important for me to contextualize and that's important for me for illustration also. Um, in 1988, I went to uh, my first class that was BA, that was a college in Haryana, Shahabad between uh, Ambala and Kurukshetra. Uh, in my first meeting with the Hello department, he said that all that I needed to do was to translate the text into simple Hindi. I did exactly that. But yes, I went beyond that. I, you know, uh, looked at the words, I gave them equivalent words, I gave them synonyms, I gave them antonyms, I told them how the same sentence can be said in so many different ways. So that's, that was my way of doing things because I had observed my teachers doing such things in the classroom and that's how I learned my language. And uh, I knew that some of these things would work and, and that was fine for me. But yes, uh, lots of uh, teachers today are doing just translation. I wouldn't say it's a grammar translation method, but it's a kind of translation method. But yes, many people go beyond that and they, they, they know how to do things in the classroom. And uh, yeah. uh, then I went to Hyderabad for my PGDT and um, MLIT in linguistics and phonetics. And uh, I... I, that was exactly 30 years ago. 30 years ago, October 1990. That was, yeah. So that was... Yeah, that was. 
I am trying to unmute him, but uh, I think there is some technical issues. That is why I am not able to mute him. I am trying okay. my best. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that was uh, in 1990. Uh, I I went to Regional Institute of English, uh, Chandigarh. I got a job. I became a lecturer, and uh, my director. Uh, uh, she, in the very first meeting, she said that you will have to give some demonstration lessons, at least one demonstration lesson uh, to the students of, uh, to the teacher trainees uh, uh, of uh, PGCT course. Uh, I uh, told her, I said, you know, I'm, I've just joined and it won't be possible for me to, uh, you know, prepare for it. Uh, and uh, if I could be excused this time and uh, maybe next time I would give a demonstration lesson. She said, no, uh, mm, uh, you can give at least one demonstration lesson. Uh, you can give more if you like. Uh, well, uh, the idea, uh, the, the, the practice there was that all the teachers one by one give at least one demonstration lessons to the teacher trainees in the real classroom situation. So we would uh, get students from, uh, we'll go to the schools, some local school, government school, and uh, we would uh, teach uh, you know, the real students, maybe class eight, nine, 10 students, and uh, our teacher trainees would sit at the back uh, and uh, observe us. They would evaluate us also. Then after that, there was some discussion also. Uh, it so happened uh, when, uh, you know, all the teachers, because I wanted to be the last, because uh, I thought, you know, I'll observe other teachers, my fellow teachers, you know, who would deliver uh, these lectures, uh, who would give demonstration lessons. Uh, and they put me at the last, and uh, mm, uh, it so happened that uh, some uh, two of three, two of the two or three teachers couldn't uh, do very well in the sense that they failed to elicit uh, responses from students. And teachers, teacher trainees, Im immediately came to conclusion that they didn't go, didn't do a good job, and that there was not much uh, student participation. And uh, and they also thought that it was all right if they also are not very successful in eliciting responses. So I thought of uh, some, something, I did a trick. I went to the principal, I, I spoke to uh, the, the, the in charge teacher and uh, I said, you know, I want the students at least uh, 20 minutes, half an hour before the appointed time. So I, uh, they did exactly that. Uh, I brought the students to the place where uh, this was to happen and uh, I, did some kind of chit chat, uh, made myself familiar. And uh, after some time, the teachers arrived and you know, the director also arrived, the lesson started. It was a big success. Uh, why I want to tell you all this, that I could create a repo with my students. Uh, and uh, you know, that's how I became successful. Uh, uh, you know, according to the, the, the participants, the, the teacher trainees, you know, who were observing me and many of them walked up to me and uh, whispered in my ears, they said, oh, your lesson was the best. Uh, and uh, that, that's, that's, so this chit chat, where does it come from? Uh, well, a communicative language teaching because there was a mention of a CBSC ELT project, CBSC ELT, CBSC uh, uh, syllabus uh, in, in the seminar note, in the webinar note. And I thought I'll talk about this also. So, so communicative language teaching, what is communicative language teaching? Uh, mm, communicative language teaching, well, uh, it has its base on, uh, mm, base in, basis in uh, Chomsky's concept of uh, competence and performance. Then uh, I think uh, mm, Halliday's uh, uh, notion of, uh, Halliday's concept of functions of language, and then finally, Delheim's concept of uh, communicative competence. And uh, when we talk about communicative competence, what is communicative competence? And what is uh, communicative language teaching? The goal of language teaching is to uh, develop communicative competence of our students uh, and not just grammatical competence. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion on uh, uh, use of grammar in the classroom, whether we should uh, you know, teach grammar ex explicitly or not, and how to do uh, a grammar in the classroom. Uh, both uh, Professor Mahanti and uh, Professor Mishra talked about uh, grammar and they gave lots of examples. Well, uh, grammar, if at all, uh, you know, has to be taught, it has to be contextualized, it has to be communicative, it has to be pedagogical. 
and when i did my uh, grammar when i did my grammar when i when i was in school we mechanically converted sentences into passive voice i I, from active to passive i said uh, we we did something like this uh, i eat my breakfast my breakfast is eaten by me uh, what do you want what is wanted by you kunin tastes bitter kunin is bitter when tasted so all you know sentences in isolation and we mechanically converted them we got a sense of confidence also because we thought that when we learned grammar we learned the language and this is a thought expressed by you know uh, both uh, my seniors in their uh, you know presentations so so grammar teaching uh, grammar can happen grammar can happen but it has to be done in a different way i mean we've done a lot of discussion on this already uh so so uh, not just linguistic competence not just grammatical competence but there are other aspects to it canali and swain i mean they 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 talked about this and they said that there's something called discourse competence there's something called strategic competence there's something called uh, socio linguistic competence we all know socio linguistic competence what is socio linguistic competence we should know when to be formal when to be informal ram naam satya hai we can't say in somebody's wedding uh, but literally there's no problem semantically there because uh, pro vice chancellor have talked about semantics semantically there's no problem when you look at the meaning of the language but socio linguistically you can't use this sentence uh, everywhere so so that is your socio linguistic competence that takes care of that then you have discourse competence discourse competence is a ability to um uh, uh, link one sentence to another sent one sentence to another sentence in a logical order your ability to see uh, you know a, a piece of writing or a piece of speech uh, you know as a whole and try to arrive some at at some kind of meaning so that is your a uh, discourse competence then there's something called strategic competence when to be formal when to be informal how to be polite when to be polite uh, when to be impolite we can use all these strategies to get our work done so we all indulge in that um uh when uh, we talk about uh, this communicative language teaching um if we if we go through a couple of uh, quotes by uh, this uh, delheims he says uh, there are rules of use without which rules of language would be useless there are rules of use without uh, without which use of grammar would be useless so so there are rules of use and he also says that it's far more difficult to formulate socio linguistic rules uh, uh, than uh, linguistic rules it's very easy to form rules of grammar but socio linguistic rules are very difficult to formulate uh, that's what he was trying to say very right he was uh because uh, uh, we know that what is polite in one situation what works in one situation doesn't work in another situation what is appropriate in one situation uh does not may not be appropriate in any other situation uh, not everything was uh, good about communicative language teaching and nothing uh, not everything is bad about communicative language teaching either but we need to be critical we need to ask ourselves when we say that we have to be appropriate uh when we say that uh, i think uh, i get a message that you know there's some problem in uh, you know listening to me so uh, just a minute uh am i audible yes sir yes sir yes yes yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, sir. yes sir. just so, so um uh, i was talking about communicative language teaching and uh, i said uh, we need to be appropriate that's what they say so who decides what is appropriate who decides uh, uh, we can say this and we can't say this again i mean that can be a tool to uh, dominate others so so that can be a tool to manipulate others so all that i want to say is that we need to be critical and decide for ourselves look at these methods and materials in a very critical way and decide what we want to do Uh, there's another thing that i would like to borrow from uh, uh, you know communicative language teaching the use of authentic materials that is very important for us authentic materials because uh, we need to uh, we talk about textbooks using textbooks in the classroom uh, but uh, uh, the 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 view is that we need to be we need to go beyond the text in the classroom we need to uh uh you know ask our students we need to encourage our students to bring some text into the classroom which may be authentic texts the teachers can bring them to the classroom uh, they can be newspapers they can be uh, 
uh, uh, you know this a uh, piece of uh, cartoon they can be uh, a write up they can be uh, a timetable anything that they can lay their hands hands on and uh, that can be used in the gram in, in the classroom and again i would say that uh, uh, it's very important to encourage your students to do this because that's how you will uh, you know empower them because they would get an idea that they are they are they are important because you are looking at their texts so so in other words students experiences of these students experiences of the word has to become text in the classroom that is very important because that's what i mean by going beyond the text because students experiences are valuable now what happens in a typical uh, you know classroom especially in convent schools especially in places when we are very enthusiastic about teaching english and we ask them not to say a single sentence in hindi or any other language in their vernacular we we oh, fight them for uh, uh, not using english in the classroom or even outside the classroom in school Uh, this is uh, very unfortunate and and uh, the politics of exclusion starts right in the classroom uh, we we give preference to a few students who answer our questions in english or who answer us who speak to us we exclude others we may exclude you know for example uh, uh, women uh, we may exclude girls and we may give more attention to boys that's also Uh, you know a problematic thing so so all these things i think we should look at it critically and decide for ourselves you know how best we can go about these things and, and not accept anything you know without questioning so so uh, another idea uh, about you know this uh, materials because materials have to be contextualized professor bishra also talked about it others also talked about it materials have to be prepared uh, bringing in our own cultural themes Uh, you know for use in the classroom that is perfectly fine uh, uh, we uh, uh, we have to do that but we must also understand that uh, mm, uh, uh, you know the materials prepared by let's say uh, mm, experts in british i mean who are material writers uh, would never advocate an approach which they cannot sell bilingual approach for example bilingual uh, uh, method for example they would never advocate of course i mean uh, uh, except some critical pedagogues you know who understand you know how valuable it is to uh, you know uh, uh, speak to the students uh, in their language uh, in their tongue and uh, do things you know successfully in the classroom communication must happen so so but uh, by and large Uh, material writers some of them you know are not practicing teachers also so they are writing materials for us and uh, uh, they would not advocate bilingual materials so so we can't expect it from them so definitely we have to have our own materials and uh, uh, at this juncture i would like to talk about the cbscelt project you know that started in late 80s and uh, you know uh, that continued uh, you know in early 90s also for some time and i was also uh, you know part of some of the deliberations that uh, were there uh, i i represented my director from regional institute of english uh, chandigarh and i went to delhi to attend uh, some conferences about this and uh, i can say that uh, uh, the 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 project was successful in the sense that it was implemented in uh, all the schools uh, at the same time uh, and uh, there was a sense of ownership because <coughs> teachers became material writers teacher became testing experts teacher became uh, teacher trainers so there were three groups of teachers and uh, they were identified senior teachers in uh, central schools only and some private schools also Uh, who had you know the cbsc syllabus and they went to plymouth to get their training but uh, they had all the information about how to you know uh, you know uh, bring in your own cultural context but what exactly went wrong because you know this uh, finds a place in uh, you know the the concept note that uh, you mentioned um, i would say that uh, uh, if at all it was not successful that was because uh, many teachers didn't know how to go about it now the problem with communicative language teaching is as i yesterday talked with uh, you know dr jha and uh, prashant ji um, uh, 
it assumes you know a level from the students from 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 the teachers if the teachers don't have that level they can't do things in the classroom when it comes to communicative language teaching and because a lot of activities that you have to do in the classroom so many teacher didn't know how to do these activities and uh, they thought that you know they just begin the activity and you know the syllabus will be over and many people found it very easy also to do this why because in the name of doing uh, you know some activities in the classroom uh, they just began it in one or two minutes you know these activities were over and they thought that their job was done and that's why it didn't become very successful because it was very difficult to train lots of uh, you know teachers at the same time and then asking them to change over time of course you know it had to be a, a slow process you know uh, this incremental change was required it happened also but if at all we failed, failed somewhere that was because you know many teachers you know uh, refused to change themselves uh, maybe not totally because of their own fault because because their own problems maybe problems with the system also um uh so so uh, uh, that was uh, uh, one project that was uh, you know started uh, for the that that was uh, uh, there in india for the first time uh, with, uh, that 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 uh, you know was introduced clt was introduced for the first time in india uh, with you know this uh, cbsc syllabus so so um uh but good teachers you know knew how to you know go about things and they were successful also um uh another thing is that uh you know uh, they also talked about uh, uh what may be called uh, this authentic materials as i already you know mentioned this so uh, they uh, you know encourage students to use authentic materials in the classroom they brought the authentic materials in the classroom so there there are all kinds of things which were required to empower students so that students you know have a voice in the classroom uh, but as i said that in our own enthusiasm when we don't allow students to you know speak in their mother tongue in their local language in in the language that they are comfortable with they 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 we cannot communicate with them it's about their right it's about you know giving them a voice it's about empowering them uh, if we don't allow them uh, you know to contribute to the discussion if we don't allow their experiences to become text in the classroom i think that's a big problem and this is what we need to take care of and uh, this is the root cause of so many problems uh, you know as far as you know language teaching is concerned that we we cannot focus on each and every one uh, professor mishra talked about comprehensible input and that uh, input has to be made comprehensible by the teacher the teacher also has to make lots of efforts to to make the input comprehensible so that's our job as a teacher so 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 uh, that that becomes uh, very important for us um uh, uh, when i talk about uh, you know contextualizing the whole thing uh, uh, we must also be aware that context uh, within you know so called uniform context uh, may not be the same for example i mean let's talk about uh, the university your university dumka and uh, if you have sections i don't know how you have uh, you know uh, uh, whether there's a kind of streaming according to their level section a section b section c section d or that's mixed ability group because mixed ability group has its own advantage and uh, you know streaming uh, according to their level i think that has its own advantages so so uh, so the advantage uh, with the uh, you know different groups is that you can do things differently as we say that not the same methodology will work in all the all the uh, you know uh, situations so so in section a the way you do things in section a you may not do the same things in section b because of their level so the idea is to come down to their level and then raise their level that i think is uh, uh, very important and uh, we need to have a kind of uh, education that is progressive and uh, when i say progressive what do i mean by this uh, when we are doing when we are uh, you know giving them an education that is progressive um we are uh, you know uh, empowering students to decide their own curriculum to decide even the methodology that they would be most comfortable with 
So you constantly need to get the feedback from students what works in the classroom and what doesn't work in the classroom. Um, in post method era, I mean, this is, uh, we say that, uh, you know, there, there's no best method. So whatever works in the classroom is the best method. But at the same time, we must also not think that, you know, we need not be aware of these methods and materials. Uh, some people say when, if, if you say that, uh, you know, there, there's no best method, then uh, there's no need to learn about these methods. Why do we learn these methods? It is very important to make and make informed decisions. That is very important because if you don't know uh, uh, what is, uh, you know, the best about this approach, what can be used, what can be borrowed, and what works, you know, uh, in such and such approach, and it's also about informing others about the best practices because you might be successful in the classroom, but you need to report it to uh, the world outside. Uh, you would say, well, uh, I used, uh, you know, a kind of structural approach or maybe I was a bit communicative and this is how I went about it. So you need to give labels also because you would like to uh, write and uh, tell the whole world that you were successful. You will be writing articles about your success stories. I think uh, that is also very important and that's important for the purpose of seminars and conferences also. So, so, so uh, that is very important. Uh, um, Honorable Vice Chancellor talked about ambiguities. Uh, you know, there should not be any ambiguities. Uh, I would, uh, you know, go further and I would say that uh, students must be made aware of if there are ambiguities in the language that is being taught or that is being used. Why? Because the ambiguities can be can be uh, not innocent. They may be deliberate. They may be manipulative. And and uh, you know uh, if you can see through that, if you can read between the lines. So we must train. I mean, uh, it's about you know teaching them some kind of uh, reading skills where critical uh, you know part is there. Critical reading skills where students can read between the lines. They are to be trained to read between the lines so that they are not easily influenced. So that they can uh, take their own decisions. So they can see through. Uh, what is happening through the use of language, how and in what way somebody is trying to influence them, I think uh, that is very important. So uh, those ambiguities and and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, when I talk about, uh, you know, this uh, teaching reading, uh, we must also tell our students that it's not always linear. I mean, if you look at some advertisements, for example, it's a non-linear text. You don't know how to start and which part you would read first. Uh, text may come with a combination of the verbal and the visual, and they are to be dealt with differently. Uh, uh, you know, how to make sense of text, that is also an important point that you need to teach at all levels. Uh, but before uh, that, you need to, you know, establish a kind of a repo. And if there, uh, you know, in, in order to achieve that, if you need to, uh, for example, uh, use uh, their mother tongue, your mother tongue, or whatever language they are comfortable with, so that they understand, uh, I think, you know, that is the uh, best thing to do. I mean, uh, you know, that is very, very, very important. Um, uh, somebody talked about uh, the teaching of phonetics also. Uh, I think Pro Vice Chancellor Sir talked about uh, phonetics. Uh, I've been teaching phonetics for a long time, and um, uh, phonetics uh, is important for the sake of phonetics as a subject. I mean, as a part of linguistics, perhaps, right? But phonetics, uh, you know, uh, I always teach with a disclaimer. I tell them that. I can't speak RP, I can't speak standard English, I can't speak standard British English or American English. So uh, that's not our aim. So in whatever language you are comfortable with, I mean, you must know that, okay, this is how they speak and this is how we can speak. Uh, we can have our own accent, we can have our own language. Uh, there was a discussion about uh, 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 Indian English also, uh, whether it exists or not. Well, if at all, there's something called Indian English we can say that, well, uh, you know, it's a highest common factor of uh, various regional accents spoken in different parts of India. And, and uh, you know, and, and um, uh, but what about teaching, uh, you know, uh, Indian English in the classroom, uh, whether it's writing or whether it is speech, uh, we can't do that, uh, uh, you know, uh, immediately because um, we don't have a reference. We don't have, we have not documented Indian English on paper. Uh, what we have is some kind of Indianisms and uh, uh, our phoneticians, our, uh, you know, uh, you know, lexicographers, 
our you know linguists can sit together and perhaps you know arrive at some kind of description of indian english and accept that where you must be knowing my brother would be acceptable uh, you know and uh, 5% weightage will be given to uh, you know some someone you know even uh, such usage would be uh, acceptable but right now it is not acceptable in standard english or you can say english people say it's not english so we need to have we need to own english english uh, you know uh, we need to work on our attitudes also english is no more the language of you know britishers american canadians new zealanders uh, uh, english is as much the language of people who use it and and unless or until you have a sense of ownership this is a matter of attitude this is a matter of motivation this is a matter of uh, you know liking it also and like it the way you speak it the way uh, you know like it the way you want to use it i think that's your english that's 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 your kind of english you may call it indian english or whatever uh, you don't need to uh, imitate you know something is uh, given to you and which comes from uh, elsewhere perhaps and that's the reason you know our university recently came out with the a language app this is pronunciation app which is available which is freely available you don't have to pay for it and uh, they say that this is uh, 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 you know uh, pronunciation uh, in bharatiya way our uh, honorable vice chancellor professor suresh kumar uh, released this uh, Our, our uh, sorry, I mean our, our education needs to release this, and our VC sir was also there. So, so uh, we we call it, you know, uh, you know, this pronunciation in Bharatiya way, and that's what uh, we can do, and that's what uh, we should do. Uh, so, so uh, uh, I'll I'll uh, you know sum up uh, by saying that well, there are uh, problems uh, uh, of. Uh, uh teaching english at all levels there have been but the best thing is to approach these problems uh, critically and see it ourselves how best we can uh, you know communicate with our students communication is very important uh, you know allowing them to have their own voice in the classroom is very important that's how we can empower them uh, that's what uh, would be linguistic empowerment and otherwise also and and uh, i would uh, you know refrain from using the word multilingual we are uh, we are plurilingual as you know professor uh, uh, you know on this uh, professor uh, uh, mohanty said so yes uh, we have to take this into consideration that we are plurilingual and uh, uh, the kind of diversity that we have so any teaching that does not you know recognize that doesn't uh, uh, take into consideration that this diversity is bound to fail so all these things we need to take care of you know when we do things in the classroom it's not very difficult if we are committed and and happy that uh, you know uh, when i was speaking to professor jha and professor prashant kumar i think they meant business and they informed me that uh, madam vice chancellor means business and uh, she uh, is really interested in uh, raising the standards of uh, uh, language teaching and language learning in the university so i wish uh, you all the best and uh, let's see how best we can go about you know everything thank you so much thank you professor arora you have given a very insightful lecture and it was a pleasure listening to you after a long time uh you have uh, given a lot of uh, uh, ideas on how to proceed and i'm very sure when some initiatives are taken in future we'll be able to implement your ideas in a very meaningful way uh now it's time to move on to the final speaker of the day for the same uh, i would like to invite professor s imtiaz hasnan professor imtiaz hasnan is currently the senior most faculty at the uh, aligarh muslim university he received uh, uh, his phd from jnu jawaharlal nehru university delhi and uh, specializes in the area of social linguistics pragmatics and critical discourse analysis professor imtiaz hasnan has served as the editor of indian linguistics and has worked in different capacities uh, and association with various uh, Uh, universities and institutions and schemes of the ministry of uh, human resource development now called the ministry of education he was the senior fellow at uh, central institute of indian languages mysore he was also the visiting scholar at indian institute of advanced studies shimla 
Professor Hasnan was also the recipient of uh, uh, President's Inspired Teacher Award for 2015. And he was the senior visiting scholar at uh, Orebro University, Sweden. He has been part of several advisory committees. He has also been uh, visitors nominally, nominee, president's nominee for uh, selection committees. There is a long list uh, 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 on the accomplishments of Professor Intiaz Asnan, but I would resist uh, the temptation of providing all that description and rather uh, invite the participants to listen to him directly. I request Professor Intiaz Asnan to begin his lecture. Over to you, Professor Asnan. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. I'm uh, thanks a lot for being so generous uh, in introducing me. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, shall I switch off my video? Because I think that disturbs. I'll just make myself audio there. Okay. If it's okay. All right, sir. All right, sir. So uh, let me uh, first uh, thank the Vice Chancellor of uh, the Sidur Kumar University, Professor Sudranjana Mintz. And uh, I was fortunate to listen to what she said. I was very unfortunate that I missed two of my learned speakers because of the faux pas that I committed right in the beginning of uh, committing myself much before I gave the dates to Dr. Tariq with regard to the very important selection committee of one of the universities, which I could not have canceled or postponed. So I'm really sorry for that. And uh, uh, I must thank Dr. Uh, Professor, Professor, Professor Deji Rao, doctor who was uh, who is a director of the Indian Institute of Indian Languages. Our uh, your pro vice chancellor, Professor Hanuman Prasad Sharma. My learned colleagues, friends, <laughs> Professor Panchanan Mohanty, Professor Avdesh Kumar Mishra, and Professor Rajneesh Arora, and of course the chair convener of the seminar, Dr. VK Jha. I have been in touch with him a number of times. And Dr. Prashant. Of course, Tarek is a person who has been coordinating the entire event. I, I must uh, connect myself to what the anecdote Professor Rajneesh Arora talked about with regard to parrot and language. And perhaps this will also take me to talk about the notion of empowerment because it alludes to empowerment notion as well. There's another aspect of that parrot and language. And that aspect is captured by a caged parrot, that is a parrot in a cage, was asked by an uncaged crow. The crow asks the parrot, why are you in a cage? And the parrot replied, because I speak. Now this is the empowerment. And I'm happy that the idea of empowerment, the notion of empowerment, the notion of linguistic empowerment was mooted by the university and was taken up happily by the Central Institute of Indian Languages. It's a very essential, very relevant topic. And let me briefly, candidly confess two things. One, when I heard the topic that was communicated to me by Dr. Tarek. Telephoned about it. And the, my expired excitement was there because being a professor of uh, social linguistics, I normally look at power in a most generic sense. Sir, you have, you have to unmute your mic. Okay, okay, okay I'm sorry. The, uh, shall I speak? Uh, the, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Am I, am, am I audible? So I'll just, uh, I, I don't think you heard anything what I said. So I'll, I'll repeat that little bit. I, I'll say that uh, uh, this, this relevance of seminar 
the topic which itself is very relevant it is uh, i'll capture this thing from the anecdote of what professor rajdish arora my predecessor talked about the parrot and language and i'm giving a different dimension aspect of that parrot and language this is a caged parrot that is a parrot in a cage who has been asked by an uncaged crow who asked the parrot why are you in a cage and the parrot says that i am caged because i speak this alludes to the notion of empowerment which has been conceived very rightly by the university by the vice chancellor of this university and i am happy that the central institute of indian languages mysore took up the proposal and here today we are there as part of that national webinar on the linguistic empowerment and i speak today on linguistic empowerment and the dilemmas of multilingualism now let me share two things with you people before i venture into talking about my presentation when dr tarik who has been coordinating this program called me up and informed about this topic i was very happy for the reasons that i represent social linguistics that's my specialization and i look at the notion of linguistic empowerment as very potent because it has immense potential and scope to develop and empower the languages of the multilingual jharkhand state by taking a variety of social linguistic issues involved in any such engagement of this nature when i spoke to dr jha i was also informed that we have to come down from the generosity to the specificity and that specificity is with regard to the linguistic empowerment vis-a-vis proficiency development in english and that's equally important because that is what is required right now because we are able to have our language but we are not able to communicate ourselves we also know english but at times we cannot communicate ourselves in a language which is communicable to others now this is a this is a this is a situation which is very important but particularly in the backdrop where the problems are english are fraught with the proficiency and communication both and both of them are the problems of speakers of language having said that let me start with my presentation i will be bringing my experiences of working in jharkhand state for a fairly long period of time right from the time i was doing my ma in jnu and then continuing my phd and that long association has given me immense experience to share with you all which have a bearing on what we talk about the linguistic empowerment today this jharkhand state when it, it when it came into existence of course it is it is a, a very encouraging to see here that there has been an unprecedented idea of deciding on maintaining its conventional multilinguality with regard to the official language that you have that is hindi with regard to the second associate official languages which are both the non scheduled and the tribal languages of the state and in total there are more than a dozen of such languages that exist in this state this may have been more as a political strategy but is also confronted with a linguistic practicality now there is a unique problem of meeting the needs of over couple over a dozen of these different languages in schools and a host of mother tongue students cohorts in a variety of bilingual and multilingual combinations the problem does not stop here in addition to sensitivity to the needs of speakers of different languages there is also an expectation of fulfilling the aspirations 
of the speakers to use english to develop proficiency in english and today's web seminar is organized to capture this aspiration by euphemistically discussing under the banner of linguistic empowerment the task is not just herculean but sisyphusian in nature in the realm of education one faces complex dilemmas these dilemmas arise from two contradictions of an essentially linguistic nature which lie at the heart of the educational policies and practices of the state the first contradiction purports education system to be multilingual and yet most educational institutions do not use the learners mother tongues as languages of learning and teaching and here i would like to share my personal experience both kinds of experiences that i would share which i encountered during my frequent field works in ranchi hazaribagh chaibasa and other areas of pre and post jharkhand way back in the early 80s when i was a student i'll give you one example of pre jharkhand the during my field work i was introduced to a person i will not name that person right now for reasons best known to all of us he is he was a kuruk teacher in one of the colleges in hazaribagh a kuruk teacher and over a period of period of time he was forced to give up his teaching in that college simply because the college felt that there is no relevance of teaching kuruk in that language in that college because there are no takers of that language now this was a very heartening experience for me because that person from the position of being a lecturer in a college was pulling a rickshaw in the city and this experience of mine really impacted me a lot because i realized that how much a language has been an enabling factor for you and also being perceived as a disabling factor for you the second experience that i had was an experience that i was working with the team of service shiksha sab abhyan and the unesco and visiting jharkhand for a, for a, for a, were more than a weeks visit we were supposed to visit the schools in and around ranchi to see the kind of languages that are being used in the schools as part of the serv shiksha abhyan and we visited the the schools which were both dominated by the kuruk language community by the santhali language community and by other language communities as well and what we found that in many of these schools the problems were there with regard to non teaching of the languages that was supposed to be taught in the schools so much so that the students who are with majority of the students representing a particular community were neither being taught by the teacher who knew that language not the textbooks that have been prepared by the service shiksha abhiyan to for the distribution of these textbooks to the school students were ever distributed and because of our visit that was not known to others but somehow it got leaked because of some reasons and they all were there to tell that we must bring back those books from the dustbin from the from the storehouse where the dust have all accumulated and they were brushed aside and they were given to the students and we were quite surprised to see that the book in santhali the book in kurukuruk the book in o were being given to the students who were not able to read the books because they were never distributed to them the books that were used in the schools were the languages which were not the languages that the teacher knew or the languages that the students were asked to learn now this is the experience that was there 
Now, this is the first contradiction that I'm talking about. The first contradiction that basically purports to the education system to be multilingual and yet more, most educational institutions do not use the learners, mother tongues. And as these mother tongues are never languages of learning and teaching. This is the first contradiction that is coming there. The second contradiction is that, that, the, 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 that the, where the issues surrounding it are, have not been satisfactorily addressed again. Now, if one looks at the linguistic landscape in and around the cities of Jharkhand state, in the, in the, in the Jharkhand state, there is a vitalities of indigenous indigenous languages. One finds there is more of lip service to the concept of multilingualism. This is I'm consciously using the term lip service because I could see that the policy is one, the practice. Is one. So there is more of a lip service to the concept of, of multilingualism. As most of the indigenous languages have not been effectively developed as potential media of instruction. Now, this is one aspect of the second contradiction that I'm talking about. I'll leave aside that and I'll add further to this contradiction. This contradiction is now with regard to English. Regarding English, the students' lack of proficiency in English is perhaps coming due to the failure to acknowledge the inevitable central centrality of English in the education, or due to the problems of lack of proficiency of teachers in the language where none of which is either being recognized or remedied by any or at any institutional level. In fact, one finds interesting case of individual bilingualism in, with vis-a-vis -vis English in, in a state like Jharkhand, rather than a societal bilingualism, because the people whom with, with whom we had interacted, the individuals were all fairly competent in uh, competent bilingual speakers, not only bilingual speakers, I'm using bilingual to include both the bilingualism and the multilingualism. But that is the value efficiency with regard to individual teacher, with regard to the individual. Hello. You are audible, sir. So I could see that there was a lot of there, 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 there were cases of individual bilingualism vis-a-vis -vis English. But when it comes to the the societal bilingualism, the societal bilingualism was largely missing. Again, vis-a-vis -vis English. Because the effort is never there to bring English to the centrality. Of the of the discussion there. Now this is this is what I observed, and this was my experience there. Now I will leave the first part of the contradiction. Now I will be taking up the second part of the contradiction, and let me preface with the remarks which follow a number of assurances and disclaimers. The first one is that whatever suggestion that I intend to make here is not, and I'm, I'm emphasizing the word not, is not that English be promoted to the detriment of other indigenous languages. The second one is that my suggestion is again not being undermined not that English is inherently a better language than any other language. The suggestion is proposed only to inform 
that English is expressly desired as a language of learning and teaching by the majority of parents and learners. And again, let me share with you this experience that many of the Oran and Ho speakers we, I had interacted with, and this is not my personal experience alone, but a number of field workers who had visited Dharkand, they had reported a similar kind of a reality. One reality that I am narrating before you all is that a child, a girl child, was scolded by the mother, not for any other thing, but for using her mother tongue. And she had been a speaker of Kuluk. When the child was scolded by the mother tongue, by the mother, later on, I the, the the mother was asked that why were you scolding the child? There was nothing that she did apparently. And the mother's response was that why is the child speaking in Kuluk? And my automatic answer, my immediate response was, why not? This is the mother tongue. And the answer was that if this is the mother tongue, where will it lead the child to? Now imagine this is the anxiety of a mother who is concerned about the future of the child. And this anxiety is very well placed. This anxiety needs to be addressed. One has to be sensitive to this anxiety. It is not a question of giving a space to the indigenous language at the cost of allowing the English to be outside the ambit of the teaching. It is a question of that, what is the perception of the speakers of a language with regard to English or with regard to any dominant language of the state? This anxiety and this sensitivity is crucial for all of us. And here, I must once again congratulate both the administration, the vice chancellor, and the entire team of the university and the Central Institute of Indian Languages for thinking about such an important topic that needs to be taken up further in both the directions. The empowerment in the sense of the English, and the empowerment in the sense of developing the indigenous languages of the community. I am aware that a number of things have been talked about by my first two learned scholars, although I'm unfortunate that I missed their presentation. What I could gather from what the presentation was given by my immediate predecessor, Professor Rajneesh Arora, I could understand from their presentation and what Professor Rajdish Arora talked about, they have largely taken up the issues of methodology, of the problems that are needed, which are important from the problems of the material selections, material developments, etc., which are all very important things when you're talking about the linguistic empowerment. I stand here today to take up another aspect which are equally important. The aspect which need not necessarily touch upon these things because I don't want to repeat what they have said. They were part of my presentation on account of the, the dearth of time that we are fit, fit, witnessing right now. I'll skip that part, but I'll take up the other dimension of that empowerment, the proposal that I, 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 that I, that I intend to suggest here. Number one is, that we must make a mandatory English proficiency programs for students and teachers. We must have an incentive-based proficiency programs for in-service teachers. And we must establish on-site language labs and other self-help facilities. I do not know if the university has a language lab. I'm sure the university must be, be having a language lab there. But 
not being aware of it, I thought that this is an equally important part that goes as part of the suggestion. We must think of provisions for English second language materials programs of less English language acquisition, development, guidance, and reference in electronic media, which will be economically feasible because internet is more accessible now. And a community service programs for senior students and graduates in areas of need. At this stage, I would also like to add here that when we talk about the proficiency, we also must take into account two things. As a social linguist, we are talking about part of it has already been touched upon by Professor Arora. When we are talking about proficiency, we also make it very clear that proficiency in developing English with regard to which variety of English. We have to be very conscious in the selection of the variety. We did not go into the variety other than what we speak in the name of our language. English is part of us. It is not a foreign language for us. It is not a second language for us. It is practically one of the scheduled languages, although it has not been given a status of being a scheduled language, except that the Sahitya Academy acknowledges and places English as one of the 24 languages that it recognizes for giving awards and publishing books. The, the, the eighth schedule does not give that status. Notwithstanding that, English is still part of us. And the variety that speak, we speak is the variety that is our English. Whether you call it as Indian English or variety that the Indians speak, that is nomenclature is your choice. But we must be clear that the proficiency has to be there with a decided acceptance of a particular variety that we want to take it up. And I'll move one step ahead in my suggestion. And this is, I hope the vice chancellor is listening to it. If not, at least the pro vice chancellor who is chairing the session may kindly communicate that we must, rather you must, I'm including myself in you as we, because I would like to be part of you. We must adopt a village and school, particularly the school in a surrounding village, because the, the, the inculcation, this entire thing of, develop, of, of arriving at a particular level of acceptance must begin from the root. And that root is where we must adopt a particular school, one or two schools, where our teachers, our teachers will be at least asked to dedicate some time for teaching children English language. Because our teachers, the teachers are, who are teaching in the college, I could hear them today. I'm, I'm very happy to say that the teachers who are there in the colleges, they are as fluent as any other teacher of English in any other college in any of the universities in India. So what is wrong if we also take out time from our schedule of teaching and dedicate ourselves to teaching the kids, the, students, the class students, English, teaching the teachers also the, the, the way the English to be taught. Much have been talked about the, the approach, approaches and methodology of teaching by Professor Arora. We must think about engaging ourselves in this kind of an endeavor and these endeavor can also become as part of not just a service that will be given to the community as such, but even in the national arena where each university is asked to contest with regard to its credibility, with regard to its finding its place in the ranking scenario of the universities which the government of India has made it mandatory for even awarding the, 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 the projects or awarding the, the grants to the universities. The mandatory thing is, where are you placed in the ranking? The ranking, which is a National Institute Ranking Framework, NIRF, which is our framework. I'm not talking about outside framework. And one of the things that is being talked about is outreach programs. 
the outreach, outreach programs carry tremendous marks. And one of the things that contributes to the outreach program is the service that you do to the community. And that service also will have a cascading impact on the children who will come out of the schools and join the university because they have been trained with additional hands, the teacher training them, the teacher imparting education to them, and you are also contributing to that dissemination of teaching to those students. And that will certainly have a long lasting effect, not only on the development, empowerment of the proficiency of the students, but even enhancing the place of the university, the name of the university as one of the universities engaged in this kind of an endeavor. Let these programs be supported by the community at large, because I'm sure the community will be equally enthusiastic and very happy to be part of this program. And we can always do it. There, there is always a possibility to carry out this program even if you have the budget, which is not very enormous in your hands. I'll stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Intiaz Asnan. It was a delight listening to you as usual, and you have given valuable ideas on how to proceed from here. I'm very sure that when the initiative is taken for developing some products, some materials for future actions, all these would be very, very helpful. I now request uh, the technical team to find out if they could play the goodwill message of P Professor D.G. Rao, Director CIIL, uh, since he has not been able to uh, join physically. If it's possible, I'll request the technical team to play the goodwill message. Sir, I am trying my best. Uh, just a few minutes. Yes. Just a minute, sir. I'm sharing. While the technical team is trying to play the video message, I would like to read out one of the questions that we have received. Oh, let us listen to the message first. We can't hear you.
I believe no one is to hear this goodwill message. Uh, either the video audio was muted at the source, or this is a technical flaw. I guess there is some technical glitch, and uh, we are yes, sorry sir. that uh, was, we could not. Uh, we could uh, not I was playing the video, and I think the audio was not there. Audio is there, no problem. Uh, let us uh, let us proceed, and uh, if possible, let us take one question raised by the participants. Uh, the question is how helpful the new education policy 2020 can be in realizing linguistic empowerment for the country. This is one question raised by the participants. Uh, I request uh, our experts if they can reflect upon this, uh, this question. Could, could, you, could you say the question again, please? Uh, the question is how uh, helpful the new education policy would be in realizing linguistic empowerment for this country. Yeah, uh, I would say, uh, I think uh, government also means business and uh, there's a lot of scope. I would say there are lots of good things and there's a lot of flexibility. So uh, even when they say that uh, the child has to uh, learn uh, English uh, during the first five years of, uh, you know, his uh, uh, schooling, uh, I think uh, 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 I think they mentioned uh, mother tongue. Uh, they mentioned, I think, local language and uh, regional language, something like that. I, I think this is this is there. So uh, they said wherever possible. Uh, I, I, I am aware that it's difficult to achieve, as you know, Professor Mohanty also said this in the morning. But then um, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, the policy means that uh, we actually uh, need to do it in all cases. And uh, they use the expression wherever possible. So, so this is one thing. There are so many other things also, and uh, which uh, would empower our learners, uh, and they're aware of uh, the advantage of bilingual methods, uh, which uh, you know not all the schools have been using. Uh, there's a fear. There's a uh, 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 some people say that uh, uh, this will affect the standards of English. I don't believe in this because uh, I believe that. Uh, mm, uh, communication is important, learning uh, language is important. And uh, if you are, I think, fluent, if you learn your own language, uh, you know, properly, and uh, if you can uh, have working knowledge uh, in uh, language A or language B or language C, I think you can learn any other language. I think the challenge before, you know, our students in uh, the university is that uh, they can't express themselves in English as well as in their mother tongue also. So if we work on their mother tongue, if we work on uh, their uh, language initially to uh, bring them to the mainstream, to bring them to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to bring them to others where, you know, some students may be, you know, better than them and they can uh, do things uh, uh, in a better way in the classroom. So I think uh, uh, that should work. Uh, this, uh, this new policy promises Lots of things, among other things, yes. Well said, sir. I, I think the policy has categorically, specifically mentioned the promotion of mother tongues, uh, minority languages, minor languages. Uh, uh, so, so there are provisions by policy. Now it is up to the institutions uh, to implement them, to realize such goals by very uh, clear uh, actions. And it depends on the people who implement the policy. It depends on how we realize the provisions of that policy. Uh, uh, we'll be able to achieve linguistic empowerment through that. I'm, I'm also very sure. Uh, now, I think uh, we should move on to uh, the next uh, uh, activity in the program. And for the same, I request uh, Dr. Prashant Kumar, uh, Professor Prashant Kumar, uh, Head PG Department of English. Siddho Kano Murmu University to propose uh, the vote of thanks. I request Professor mm -hmm. Prashant to take over from now. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. 
uh, for such a delightful afternoon today and having such a brainstorming session on different aspects, a wide range of language teaching, and how to develop and improve linguistic ability, proficiency of our learners. Of well, you must be planning, you must be planning to have a very vibrant evening. So I don't want to be in between your vibrant evening and this brainstorming session. But if I fail, if I don't express my sense of gratitude, I'll be failing in my duty. So with the permission, then I think I yeah, stand hereby to propose a vote of thanks. Well, at the very beginning, it is Dr. Tariq Yu who set the tone and who made it very significant that how significant linguistic proficiency, especially in case of English. And then our vice chancellor, who muted the idea, who envisioned the entire idea, and the idea of introducing a syllabus, a curriculum, just before going to the Board of Studies. And he entrusted the task to our professor, Vinod Kumar Jha. And the way Professor Vinod Kumar Jha succeeded in translating the vision of our vice chancellor with the support of the CIL, with the support of the FLU, different directors, different centers, well, it's really, I, I don't have any words to say thank you. Thank you is a very minor word. Well, it's very difficult. It's not possible in the given time of the times to take up the contribution of each of the speakers. But permit me to collectively thank everyone with highlighting some of the points. We are really thankful to our vice chancellor for giving us an opportunity. Simultaneously, we are also thankful to the Central Institute of Indian Languages, and especially Dr. Rao, who decided and who gave us the support of collaborating with such a new university. I think that was a clear reflection of the fact of the determination of the policy that the center is trying to bring new centers in the margins. And for that, any word, anything would be less than being thankful. Well, as regards proficiency, the scholars from beginning from uh, Dr. Abhay Sharma and uh, Dr. Tadev himself, Dr. Binut Macha, Kanchanan Mohanty, Abhish Mishaji and Hasnain sir, and uh, our Rajnish Arura sir, and uh, the nation of uh, Mr. Hasnain, finally. Well, it was very clear. You not only covered the curriculum aspect, the entire sociolinguistic aspect that we face here as a teacher and our students face as a learner of English <coughs> have been covered. And you have simply validated our point of view that it is not simply in terms of curriculum or an apt CLT curriculum, I say, that we are lacking. But we do have not very appropriate or well-trained teachers to deliver those curriculum. The way Haslan sir made it clear, and Mohanty sir also revalidated, that it is not the fault of our learner that they cannot speak English. Because the innate ability to learn English is a human quality. The problem in our area is because of the multilinguistic background and because of the external factors of the learners, like family background in the school, etc., which all of you have covered, we face a problem. And we are really confused, especially when it comes to the pronunciation, because uh, our students are usually from the Austrian background where the pronunciation is entirely different. In fact, they have to pick up English as a third language, not even as a second language. So all those things have been covered. And uh, the psychological, psycholinguistic aspects, social linguistic, all those you have covered so nicely. And I'm very happy to assure Dr. Haslan that we have already adopted a village of 
course, we are not concentrating only the language skill. We have adopted a village for social work. And your suggestion has been taken very seriously. And the department will definitely look after that. At least for the primary level, you would like to teach the English. As regards your suggestion of introducing a mandatory, a compulsory course at the foundation level, I'm very happy to say it is because of this that we wanted it to be validated from the experts who are the luminaries of linguistics. And once again, I go back to Guru Kumar Jha and our vice chancellor who envisioned this idea. And I'm really thankful to all of you, sir, especially all the AFL centers of Shillong, Lucknow, Bhuvaneshwar, CIFL, Madhrabad, and our Mohanti, sir, and DG Roy and others that you have unquestionably supported us like anything. And we are here to accept your leadership. And under your leadership and stewardship, we hope our learners will also be happy to pick up. And I'm sure it won't be far when the subaltern will be able to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's the end of the program today. Hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Good day. Okay, Tariq Bhai. Thank you. Tariq Bhai. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Tariq Khan, sir. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. And my regards to all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tariq Bhai. Thank you, uh, Jha Saab. Thank you, Prashant Ji. Goodbye, Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you Sure.